I smiled this morning when I got the beautifully typed, um, I want to call it agenda, it's not, it's the, the order of service, if you like, that all the service leaders prepare before a service, and I've done it myself, usually on a scrap of paper handwritten, but the beautifully typed one this morning comes with a disclaimer, and it says at the bottom, we reserve the right to change any of the above at extremely short or no notice. As the Holy Spirit leads and directs, this in no way affects your statutory rights as a visitor or regular member of Christ Church. Now, those of you who know me well will know that very often when I've spoken in the past, the Lord has given, us, given me a message at home and I've written it all down and I get here and he goes, no, I don't want you to say that. So the same disclaimer, the notes that are going out to the small group leaders may or may not represent what's written down. So we'll see how we go. But, you know, praise and glory go to the Holy Spirit. This is about him and not about me. So I want to um, just start by saying that a lot of what's already been said will be duplicated and repeated. I think it would be impossible to go through the week we've been through without mentioning the referendum. It's been so in our face. You know, there is other things going on in the world, but it's been in our face this week. And it's been a historic week in the UK as far as politics is concerned, a week where we were given a choice. In, um, in time, it will determine the future of our country, the choice that has been made. And I, like many of you, struggle to see a way through some of the arguments for and against staying in the EU. Mostly, I have to say, because of the behavior of the people who were leading the campaigns on both sides. Um, there were so many lies, there was confusion, there was aggressive argument, and the rest of Europe looked on in disbelief. In fact, the whole world probably looked at the UK and thought, what on earth is going on? It was ugly. It was ugly. Um, I made my decision. I went to the community center, cast my vote, job done, the rest is history. And the future looks uncertain and confusing for some, while for others there is a view of opportunity and a brighter future. And I think what Glyn said and read this morning mirrors how I've been feeling since the result came out that people who I have respected as Christian friends have posted on social media some really horrible stuff. And it's there for everyone to see, and that bothers me. Life's full of choices. Every day, from the minute we wake up, we're making choices. Some of them we don't even realize are a choice. We get up, you know, what time do we get up? What do we wear? What do we eat for breakfast? At other times, the decisions we make are momentous. They have far more impact. They will affect us. They will affect other people. The referendum was just one of those. You can think about what career path do you want to take, who to marry, when to have children, becoming a Christian, huge decisions that have an impact. And the reality is we don't know what is going to happen in any given situation, ever. We don't know if the vote had gone the other way, what the future would have been. We can imagine what it was like, but we don't really know, and we don't know what it's like now, really. We just don't know. We can make certain assumptions. I can assume I'm going to get up tomorrow and I'm going to drive to Hitchin and I'm going to go to work. We can make plans like when we're going to go on holiday. But we live in an uncertain world. There are no guarantees. We have right here, right now. That's what we have. Right here, right now. So for the second time this week, I found myself in a position where I've made another momentous decision. I've decided I don't want to be labeled as a Christian. And as we look at the passage today, I'll explain to you why I've made that decision. Okay. Luke chapter 9. If you read it in its entirety, it's like a blockbuster movie. If you've got a Bible that has subheadings, they go like this. Jesus sends out the 12. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus predicts his death, the transfiguration. Jesus heals the demon-possessed boy. 
Jesus predicts his death a second time, Samaritan opposition, and the cost of following Jesus. That's a lot for one chapter, right? All those things in Luke chapter 9. There is so much in there. But I'm going to start slightly ahead of where Bob read for us. I'm going to start in verse 44. So verse 44 reads, if I can find it, I'm in the wrong book, bear with. I'm going to read it from here. It's bigger print. So Jesus has just healed the demon-possessed boy. And in verse 43, they're all amazed by the greatness of God. Okay, Everyone who sees this is amazed by the greatness of God. And then in verse 44, Jesus says, Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they didn't get it. They didn't understand it. And it says they were too afraid to ask him about it. Moving on. What happens next? What did they do? The disciples, they've spent three years with Jesus. What did they do? They argued about who would be the greatest. They argued about who would be the greatest. The Messiah has just told them he's about to sacrifice himself for the whole of humanity, and they argue about their position. Kind of sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? I don't think this scripture was kind of brought this week by accident. It's just so human. We just don't get it sometimes. Just think about that, and we'll come back to that maybe a bit later. But moving on, we're going to read from verse 51, as uh, Bob did earlier. As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, and he sent messengers on ahead, who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord... Do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. Jesus was deadly serious. He set out resolutely for Jerusalem. He knows what's about to happen. He's already predicted his death twice in the chapter. He knows where he's going. He knows how the story ends. But he is resolved to fulfill what his purpose on earth was. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going into a situation where I think I might come out a little bit damaged, I don't go resolutely. I might just delay it a little bit. I might find a reason not to go. I might try and find a way around it. But Jesus was determined. He was going to go and he was going to fulfill his purpose on earth. Jesus isn't welcomed in the Samaritan village, and the disciples, James and John, they're outraged, and they're like, Lord, shall we call down fire? Now, when I read this, it reminds us of Elijah calling down fire in 2 Kings chapter 1. I think the difference here is, in the Old Testament, when Elijah called down fire, He brought it down to prove who God was, is. In this story, to me, it was about a spirit of retaliation. God was with them. Jesus was right there. If he wanted to strike them down, he could do it like that. Are they still trying to vie for position? Is that argument still going on? Is that what their focus is on? How do we respond in the face of opposition? Opposition causes division, and we've seen that through social media. We've referred to it already this morning. And the more we state our case and have to prove to be right, the more divisive it becomes. 
Aggression and retaliation is not the model Jesus shows us. It's not what he was about. As in this case, living out his instruction from verse 5 in chapter 9, he said, If people don't welcome you, leave their town, shake the dust off your feet, move on. He won't stay where he isn't welcome, and he doesn't force his way in. That's not how it works. I suspect that's why he spent so much time with sinners. Now, we're all sinners, but with people who at the time were regarded as sinful people. And I think he did that because they knew their need for God. They were open. They wanted to receive him. They wanted what Jesus had for them. Whereas those of us who know it all, well, we don't really need him, do we? Not really. We're okay. Don't get me wrong, God has no favorites. He loves us all the same. He loves everybody on the planet the same. Whether you voted in, you voted out, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in Europe, whether you're in America, whether you're in Afghanistan, he loves us all the same. But if we don't know our need for Jesus, he'll go where people do. Our mandate is to bring love. It's to bring peace. It's to bring compassion and understanding. We are Jesus' representatives. What do people see when they look at us? What do they see when they read our Facebook page, our Twitter feed, our blogs, when they hear us in the pub, in the restaurant, whatever? What do they see? Let's carry on. Verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, when you read that, you think, well, that's not an unreasonable request. But at that time, funerals, and probably still in the Middle East, happened very, very quickly. So it may be that his father was ill and he was waiting for him to die before he could follow. We don't know. Jesus' response, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Whenever I read that particular verse, I always think of the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. You know the one? I've been singing it in my head since yesterday. The cross before me, the world behind me. I know physically I have the cross behind me. It's a very powerful image. Follow me, Jesus says. How quickly do we respond if we have a call on our lives? How quickly do we respond? Let's just contrast those responses with the call for the, uh, the first disciples back in uh, Matthew chapter 4. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him, James and John. They heard the call. They responded immediately. 
But we've already heard, after three years of being with Jesus, with the Messiah, they're arguing. They're talking retaliation. Do we respond like the first disciples? Are we prepared to drop everything right here, right now, to do what God is calling us to do? Or are we going to delay? Are we going to put up barriers? Are we going to make excuses? As the men detailed in Luke. Are we going to prioritize stuff? Is it about stuff? Is it about, well, when I've got enough money, I'll do that? Is it about putting other things first? Well, you know, my family, my friends, my job. We live in a world obsessed with self. Obsessed. What will it cost me? Is it important to me? What's in it for me? And this week, the question is, what does it mean for me? How will it affect us? How many times have you said it? How many times have you heard it? Are we moving resolutely into whatever God has called us to? Are we putting up barriers? Are we making excuses because there is a cost of of some sort to us? Are we willing to make the decision to do whatever it takes, whatever it costs? It's a serious question. I said earlier I didn't want to be labeled as a Christian. What did I mean by that? I don't want to be a poor representative for Jesus. We heard the scripture this morning that Glyn read about being ambassadors for Christ. People looking at our country, our nation, over the last few weeks, what kind of impression have our political leaders made across all parties? I don't want to be someone who lets Jesus down. I'm a flawed human being. I'm sure many of you here can testify to that. I know I'm not perfect. And I can't be because I'm human. None of us can. We're all works in progress. We're also told in Ephesians 2.10 that we're God's handiwork. Some translations... God's masterpiece, love that. His best work. We're not perfect in this life. We're works in progress, but God loves us. He created us as his best work. I want people to see in me what it is to be an authentic Christian, to reflect Jesus to others. I want to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus. I want to be a good ambassador for Christ. There are a number of reasons why we we don't do that, why we hold back, why we delay doing things. And part of that may be because we have something within us that we don't like. I'll share a story with you. Has anyone flown EasyJet here? Yeah, You know, they're one bag rule. And if you want to put a bag in the hold, you have to pay. Who wants to pay 20 quid, right? So I went to Belfast last year with my hold all. I had a very small handbag squeezed down the side, and that bag was rammed. I'm telling you, Tetris of the packing world. It was all in there. When I came back, I thought, well, it went in on the way out, so it's going to go in on the way back. I bought a couple of souvenirs. I even got those in. Job done. Great job. I get to security. I lug my bag that weighed about three ton onto the scanner, and it goes through, and the man says, whose bag is this? Mine. He unzipped the bag, and I kid you not. Now, bearing in mind, I've worn all these clothes. All of them, even the you know, the little ones, and my clothes, and my shoes, and my, was everywhere, because I had bought 
a stainless steel milk churn, which had shown up on the scanner, which I cleverly put in my trainer, which was at the bottom of the bag. And then he goes, oh, that's all right. He just shoves me along with this mountain, and I had to repack my bag. It was not a good day. It was not a good day. But imagine, I nearly died. But I was thinking about this yesterday, and I don't know, God does this sometimes. What if our lives are in that bag? What if we put our lives through a spiritual scanner, if you like? What's in there? What's hidden at the bottom? What is your stainless steel milk churn? What is it? Is our church face, this one, the same as our family face? Or our friend face? Or our work face? Are we consistent? Are we the same here and out there? Do we match up? Am I authentic? Not always, if I'm honest. But I'm a work in progress. I'm working on it. The thing is that once we start on this journey, if we're serious about following Jesus, if we're serious about this journey we've started, there's going to be opposition. There are going to be trials. And there will be a cost. And we'll be shown for who we are. There's nothing people like more than to say, thought you were a Christian. That's not very Christian. My dad isn't a Christian, but he's more Christian than most Christians I know. And Justin's shaking his head, he's met him. He is the most Christian person I know, and he doesn't believe. We can't afford to be fake. Time is short. We cannot afford to be fake. We've got to mean it. We have to move resolutely forward, as Jesus did. We need to resolve we're going to do this. We need to resolve that we're serious, and we can't turn back. We can't revert to our old ways. We'll fall, we'll sin, we'll get it wrong. But we need to pick ourselves up and keep moving forward, striving towards the goal, aiming for the prize, as Paul tells us. Forward into the purposes God has set for us, walking in obedience. If God tells you to do something, do it. If you're not sure then get someone to pray with you about it. Because God will confirm his call on your life. I have absolutely no doubt about that. One thing's for sure, we can't change anything that's already happened. In any area of life, what has been has gone. The referendum result is what it is. We can't change it whether we like it or we don't like it. It doesn't matter. The result stands. What we can do is result to be what God calls us to be, moving forward. He's in control no matter how much chaos we see, no matter that the Prime Minister's changing, no matter that the Labour Party will probably have a new leader, no matter that currencies are going all over the place and share prices have plummeted. We would have expected that probably, whatever the result, because people are profiting from that. What's in it for me? But it will stabilise. It will settle. God will make a way through it, no matter how we feel about it as we sit here this morning. We mustn't worry. We're told so many times in the Bible, don't worry. So let's not worry, because if God is in control, it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter how we voted. It doesn't matter what the result was. And any area of your life that you have regret, leave it at the foot of the cross. You can't change it, what's gone before. You can work towards reconciliation and healing. If it's a relationship, you can do all of that. But you can't change anything that you've said in the past. You can't change anything you've posted on Facebook. You can delete it, but it's been out there. 
when we leave here today, we need to be very careful what people see when they look at us. It's a confused world out there. There's no certainty with what's going on in different places, Paris, Brussels, Tunisia, Egypt, Afghanistan, you name it, Orlando. We have no guarantees. It could be Luton Town Center. It could be Bushmead. It could be Christchurch that's in the news for all the wrong reasons. We have right here, right now. Life's short. It's a blink. And I think as I head on the uh, edge of a new decade of life in eight days, when I will be 30, obviously, um, <laughs> The older we get, the more we realize how short life is. But we have the promise of eternity, and eternity is a long time. Now, Muhammad Ali was asked 40 years ago what he was going to do with the rest of his life when he retired from boxing. There's a video on YouTube. You should look at it. It's very funny, but it actually made me hold my breath. And this young lad says to him, so when you retire from boxing, what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And his first response was, I'm going to sleep. And then he said, no. And then he went into how little time, he broke it down, and we haven't got time to do it now, so watch the video. He, he said about how little time we have to make a difference. And I think we would all agree that he made a difference. And he said, I will spend the rest of my life, when I retire from boxing, preparing to meet God. Preparing to meet God. Because he said, this life is really, really short. Really short. It's, it's nothing in the scheme of things. If we have... You know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 150, 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years, it's still nothing. And he talks about eternity being like the Sahara Desert. And he says, that's a lot of sand, right? He said, imagine, now I don't have the Sahara Desert, but I do have a jar of sugar that I borrowed. Thanks, Anne. Um, he said, imagine the Sahara Desert and you have to move all the sand one grain at a time. But you have to wait a thousand years between each grain of sand before you can move the next one. And your job is to move all the sand of the Sahara Desert. Now, I don't know how long that would take, but that is one jar of sugar. There are, who'd like to count how many grains of sugar there are in it? It's a lot, right? That is, that is our promise. This represents eternity. When you put sugar in your tea, I want you to remember this. This represents eternity. That is the choice we can make right here, right now, to walk into the promise that God has for us as fully devoted followers of Jesus without looking back as Christ's ambassadors. This is our moment to rise and shine, to be fully devoted followers of Jesus, whatever it costs.